Tasmania, we're in Australia, we've had a couple of books come out within months of each other that look at the evidence around what happened at Risdon Cove in 1804. This was one of the first recorded conflicts between Aboriginal people and settlers in Australia. One of the books is called White Lies by historians Scott Seymour and George Brown. They're here in the Hobart studio with me this morning. Scott Seymour, good morning. Good morning, Rick. And Scott, you might remember from that uh, extraordinary Anzac story we heard, and that mm. book, No Turning Back, has been going gangbusters. It has. It's, it's a nice dear. And George Brown, co-author. G'day, George. Hello, Rick. Uh, now, the other book is called The Killing at Risdon Cove and is written by W.F. Refshauger, Bill Refshauger, who joins us this morning on the line from Canberra. Hello, Bill. And nice to have you here. And also in the conversation is Aboriginal historian Jeff McLean. Hi, Jeff. Hello, Rick. Hello, who's, everybody else. Who's been having conversations with Scott Seymour about this. So I'll try and keep you visualising everyone we've got here this morning. Cast of thousands. Uh, let's start with you, Scott and George. White Lies, why did you want to go over the evidence? What's your interest in this? Well, it was just initially out of curiosity. I mean, it was um, it's such a talked about story it's such a, a talked about part of Tasmanian history and I I just wanted to read a little bit more about it but the more I read about it the more conflicting stories there seemed to be and that's where the interest started so I thought well you know having an interest in general history anyway uh, I thought I'd start looking into it and uh, went from there and Bill what was your interest in doing it you're in Canberra you you're an historian you've covered lots of aspects of Australian history why this part Uh, I've had an interest in Riston Co. for some time, but the more of the accounts I read, the less satisfied I was with them. The more I dug into the original material, uh, the more I found that there was, in fact, a coherent story there, but it wasn't the one which we were being told. So, little by little, my own book emerged. Each of these books forensically pull apart the evidence as it's been, I guess, allowed to stand as people have built layers and layers of story on top of it. Jeff, <gasps> Jeff McLean, you're a Tasmanian Aboriginal and an historian. What's your interest in Wisdom Cove? Is it important to you? I've just got to correct you there a little bit there, Rick. Um, I actually have Victorian Aboriginal heritage. Sorry. Ah, uh, right. Okay. I wasn't aware of that. It's good to know. Yep. Uh, so what's your interest then? My interest is, as someone who's been researching and teaching Aboriginal history for a number of years now, um, and again, like both, all well, three authors there, uh, you go through a number of different authors and historians who give you a number of different stories, and it seems to be that the story of Risen Cove has evolved over 186 years, and there seems to be more mystery created over that time than there has been uncovered fact. So it was interesting to see these latest books come out that have gone over all the stuff that's gone before it and in the case of uh, White Lies uncovered some actual um, interesting, un previously unknown information from what we can tell. Scott, what did you find that Jeff's referring to? Well, one of the most interesting things is the statement by uh, the said convict Edward White who appeared in 1830 to the, uh, the, the committee that was held into Aboriginal Affairs. Um, the interesting thing there is that uh, all of the history books prior to ours uh, have all stated that, um, you know, in his statement, he, uh, I mean, he talks about a lot of different things in his statement, but one of the things he says is that the, the Indigenous people at Risdon Cove on the 3rd of May never came within half a quarter mile of Burke's hut, when in actual fact, if you look at the original <clears throat> excuse me, the original written statement, it says that they never came within a quarter of a mile of Burke's hut. Now, that may seem insignificant, but it goes to show that none of the historians prior to us have seemed to bothered looking at the original. Bill Refthauger, did you find a similar thing, that there was discrepancies between contemporary retellings of the history of Risdon Cove and what's in the original documents? It's quite interesting how the... Uh, primary sources have been used or misused by previous commentators. Uh, there has been a certain amount of selectivity. One, uh, an, another item which I would uh, cite is that it's quite clear that the two original farmers, Bert that Scott's already mentioned and another guy called Clark, were granted 100 acre farms. But no uh, commentator up to now has actually mentioned that. And that's a fairly important bit of information in trying to work out where they were. 100 acres around Rooston Cove is quite a big area. Uh, and 
on the other hand, bits and pieces get made up. When the Aborigines were shot at and ran away, some of the settlers followed after them. Uh, some historians have added fancy touches like shooting as they went, which in the circumstances is highly unlikely and certainly unattested by the evidence. When you put all these bits and pieces together, you start to get a bit nervous about just what the historians are telling us. So, Jeff, as you're hearing this, how did you first hear the story? How did I first hear the story? Yeah, how was it first told to you as this is what happened at Risdon Cove? Well, uh, you have to go right back to primary school if you want to go back to the very first one. Let's go back. Um, interestingly, uh, um, growing up in Tasmania, uh, you have been born and bred here, uh, I didn't really uh, get taught much at school about you know, proper Tasmanian history. When I say proper Tasmanian history, I mean... Aboriginal history in Tasmania, you know, 40,000 years of, of history that's been ignored for so long. And we went on a field trip when I was in grade six to Risdon Cove, but we weren't told anything much about the Aboriginal story. That was all about the settlers, or well, appropriately, the, the European invaders who came to Tasmania. Uh, all we were told is that some Aboriginal people were killed, and that was it. There was nothing else about it. And then when I got into studying... <coughs> excuse me. Aboriginal history itself, and learning more about it, and coming across all these historians who have written about Risdon Cove and finding that there were so many contradictory stories about what happened there, I wanted to find out more. And the historian in me wants to get to the bottom of it. I want the facts. Um, I'm not interested in, in myth and story. I want to know exactly what happened. So that's where I find uh, the research done by Scott and George is, is interesting in the fact that they seem to have uncovered the fact that the the primary witness who gave evidence at the 1830 Broughton Committee may, have, may not well have existed at Brisbane Cove at the time, and that creates a whole new conundrum. Why do you think, George, that that, that witness was, may not have been there? Uh, the evidence doesn't really point to him being there. And uh, Is this White? Edward White? Edward White, yeah. yeah Eddie White. Um, his statement's uh, just a hodgepodge. And we've looked at the original document from the 1830 commission. Yes. Um, and it's it just seems as though you put all the facts together as we know them, roughly, and his statement just doesn't hold water, really. Bill Refshager, you had a look at his statement in terms of the language in the statement. Do you think he's a reliable witness? Firstly, I think we should point out that uh, Scott and George have discovered uh, a truly momentous bit of information. Uh, as I recall from their book, uh, Edward White's name doesn't appear in the early musters, uh, which is a big worry. Uh, but it's something which needs to be taken with a, 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 a bit of care. Uh, a lot more investigation needs to be undertaken before we can say that Edward White wasn't in uh, the vicinity. Uh, and there are, I think, some bits of information both within his statement and in the fact that he was taken seriously by the 1830 inquiry and so on, which suggests that indeed he may have been. At the moment, it's a big question mark, uh, but one which uh, uh, should be put to the credit of George and Scott. They have discovered something which no other historian has yet discovered, and it's going to change the way in which we approach uh, the evidence about Risdon Cove. But it shouldn't be got too much out of perspective. Uh, I hadn't discovered it, and I'm a little bit shocked and still trying to work out the, the implications, but I'm not sure that they run quite as far as George and Scott uh, may think. Um, uh, to take one example, um, it seems to me fairly clear that when the Aborigines entered the new English settlement, uh, they were astonished. They were not expecting it to be there. Uh, the best evidence we have comes from Edward White. But if you go back another way and look at the anthropological information, who these Aborigines were, where they came from, you can fairly easily reconstruct the idea that they would have been surprised by the presence of the English. So while Edward White's evidence is extremely important uh, and its significance has been brought into doubt by George uh, and Scott, uh, it's not fatal to the story of Riston Cove. One of the things, Bill, that you raise is the idea that a lot of the histories don't even ask which group it is yes. that walk into the ground. Now, from your work, you conclude it's who? I'm sorry? 
from your work, you conclude it's which tribe or band? Oh, yes. Um, uh, well, in fact, look, I, um, there are four, uh, I think, key findings in my book. The first one is, as you mentioned, that we can say what the, shall we say, the ethnicity of the Aborigines were. So they were from the Big River tribe, which is across the Jordan River from where Risting Cove is. Secondly, we can, with reasonable confidence, say what the number of the Aborigines were. It was more than 300 and less than 400 on what we currently know. Thirdly, uh, again, because of the size of Burtz and Clark's farms, we know that the Aborigines entered the settlement from the north. That's important for reasons I won't go into right now. But finally, most importantly, we can say that when the, uh, the English settlers fired on the Aborigines, there certainly were casualties, and indeed we can put some limit on the number of casualties. In the book, I suggest, as a starting figure, somewhere between about 7 and 13. Uh, and this is to do with a very detailed study of the ballistics of the weaponry used, which is there. I just want to go to Jeff yes. quickly. Jeff, in terms of who was there, which group of people, what do you understand it to be? Oh, oh excuse me. Well, it's, it's, I think it's hard to turn, nail it down exactly, although what um, Bill's come up with here is a, a compelling story. But I would disagree with the fact that Aboriginal people were astonished to find the white invaders there. To say that they're... <coughs> this is, what, uh, about seven or eight months after they first got there. To say they were astonished would be to say that there's no communication lines between the various tribes in Tasmania, and that's just not true. And we've got the case that um, there was a, an earlier uh, sort of meeting, well, I think it was me and uh, came across a group in north of Riston Cove. Yes. So... To, to sort of say that they are astonished, and to me, defies belief. Um, I think the communication lines are well and truly open, and that the Aboriginal people who came there knew that they were there, but they were on their way to their traditional celebrations for the year, and it was all in all likelihood um, a catalyst for the clash may have been the fact that those white fellows had transgressed Aboriginal law. That would be cause for great disturbance among the Aboriginal people. So, Scott, uh, coming back to you then, where, in terms of what you found, no one disagrees that people were killed. Oh, no. No one disagrees that no. the English fired the shots. No, no, absolutely not. No. In an attempt, presumably, to defend themselves because they were presumably afraid. But at that point, we're guessing oh, yeah. because there's no evidence beyond that. No, no. Where do you want to go from here? What, what, in publishing this, do you want to change? What, how do you want to see things move forward? Well, I'm, I'm not really sure that we can literally change anything but um if i can if i can just um ask uh, bill one quick question um bill I, i'm wondering uh, down here in hobart just about every year especially on australia day we often hear people say uh, especially at parliament house um, we often hear people say that at risden cove that there was an entire tribe of men women and children slaughtered on the 3rd of may 1804 um, now i can't find we can't find anything to suggest that that's true. What would your opinion of that statement be? Uh, I, I, I retreat a bit into technicalities. Um, as far as the evidence goes, there was a, a small amount of shooting with muskets, particularly in, in rescuing Bert from being beaten up. Mm. Uh, but the main uh, firepower was the, 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 the shooting of a carronade, a small yes. car cannon, uh, just once. Mm. Now, I think the most likely load it carried was naval case shot, right. which is a series of steel balls uh, about an inch and a quarter in diameter. If you got hit by one of them, you'd remember it. Mm. Uh, but there are only 42 of those in a load. Yes. Now, allowing for ricocheting, double shotting, missing, mm. and all the rest of it, it would seem that somewhere less than 42 is going to be the number of people who were shot. Right. The more you work through it, the more it comes down to something of the order of, say, 10. Yeah. Uh, so the idea that entire tribes were wiped out just doesn't make sense in terms of the technology. No. Uh, indeed, anything more than about 15 or perhaps 20 mm. uh, just def defies physical logic. Yeah. At the heart of it, though, Bill Refs, Hauger, Scott Seymour, George Brown, you'd all agree people died, yes. that yeah. the engagement was the beginning of where we are now. 
Jeff McLean, where do you think these books leave us? Oh, where do they leave us? They leave us with some more questions, I would imagine. Um, yeah. As there is a birth of actual first-hand accounts of what happened at Risen Cove, unless somebody invents a time machine and goes back, we're never, ever going to know. Um, but what I, I think in a, in a more contemporary context is that there's been too much argument over numbers killed, which has overshadowed the fact that the clash between the invaders and the Aboriginal people was the first violent clash in Tasmania and a precursor of the absolute devastation to Aboriginal people of communities, cultures across Tasmania that was to come. And although it may not have been a catalyst, it was certainly, certainly a preview. And that should never be forgotten. And it's a shame that that sometimes gets lost in the argument over is it a massacre or is it it not a massacre? Uh, Heather Skullthorpe is CEO of the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre. She can also give you a power report from Kingston Beach. Hello, Heather. <laughs> Good morning, Rick. Good morning. Uh, you've got power on? Yes. Your phone's working. Yep, it's good. It's good to hear. Uh, you had a listen to the conversation we had yesterday, an amateur historian locally, a historian from Canberra, both had a look at all the stuff around Risdon Cove again, have put some books out to try and, I guess, reset that conversation. Uh, which has become so controversial and got away from the point there, really, which is this is where things started to go wrong in the relationship. And what can we do to write it? Are these histories and discussions helpful, Heather? Uh, Not at all. I listened with increasing disbelief to the conversation yesterday. And you do have to wonder about the definition of a historian, I have to say. Um, that, That came down to uh, were the people a quarter of a mile away or half of a quarter of a mile away. Uh, uh, really, really. Uh, nobody disputes that white people invaded our lands at Risdon Cove and then when Aborigines peacefully came down hunting kangaroo, men, women and children, they were fired upon and people were killed. Now, uh, beyond that, then people will want to examine it perhaps, but for, to, to no avail. We were dispossessed and the states have, state of Tasmania and Australia has nothing to redress, done nothing to redress that ever since. So our dispossession and domination continues. Just have a look at it. We ask for seats in Parliament, Rick. We get uh, the Premier redefining Aboriginality uh, on our behalf, which no one asked him to do. We complain that our social disadvantage is not being uh, addressed and, in fact, our youth programs and so on are being defunded. We get constitutional recognition in Tasmania, perhaps. We complain about over-representation in prison. Uh, We get uh, the attorney talking about getting rid of suspended sentences and bringing in uh, minimum sentencing, all of which disproportionately affects Aborigines. We ask for the return of land... Uh, and we get the Commonwealth and the state aligning against us to try and overcome the federal court case uh, that said that four-wheel drives are no longer allowed to wreck our heritage on the West Coast. And it goes on and on. We ask for Aboriginal control of the assessment of Aboriginal values in the World Heritage Area, uh, and we get a reduction in federal funds uh, to do that very thing. So on all fronts, we are being more and more hemmed in, being more and more dominated day by day, and at neither federal nor state level are we making any inroads in Tasmania as in the rest of the country where they're trying to force the closure of Aboriginal communities. There's been better times and better relationships with other governments. What do you think is happening in this country that this conversation is becoming so... I think hemmed in is an excellent description. Look, you do have to wonder, don't you? Uh, when we know populist politics always comes to the fore and the, the politicians in a electoral mode will do things for a few extra votes in marginal electorates, uh, this Tasmanian government is just a, a 
appalling in continuing to provide any financial support for anything. It's the only jurisdiction in Australia which doesn't separately top up federal funding to Aboriginal communities. Uh, so what's going on? I don't know. Uh, we hear day after day uh, announcements of grants for this thing or that thing, tourism or, you know, neighbourhood houses, whatever. Not one cent for uh, to, uh, for Aboriginal youth programs which are being defunded. The, the uh, return of the Aboriginal Legal Service. We have been lobbying for that ever since the Commonwealth took that legal service off us. No one's listening to that either. So for another jurisdiction to come in and try to run someone else's Aboriginal legal service is such a slap in the face here. Uh, and the state government does absolutely nothing to support our efforts to get our legal service back, for instance. What would you like to see happen in the short term in terms of people authoring books about the relationship between uh, the colonial invaders, as you call them, and Aboriginal people? Why what don't they is going to some- move this forward? Yeah, why don't they do something uh, to support the Aboriginal community being able to uh, make its own productions? Uh, there's been a plethora of books about Aboriginal Tasmania in the last little while. None of them have done anything new. They go back to George Augustus Robinson or Linda Ryan. Nothing new. Uh, they might put their own interpretation on it. They have to do that because uh, mostly they're attached to, apart from these latest lot, which aren't even academics, but they have to do something new to get any standing with that within academia. So they make up some new interpretation of our history. Why not uh, help the Aboriginal community to make its own productions or its own plays, its own films, have its own conversations about our interpretation of what happened? That would be a start. Nathan Maynard's gone some way towards making that happen, uh, yeah. working with Tasmania Performs for the first time, and it's going to be really exciting to hear those voices That's emerge. fantastic. And yeah. one example after all this time. But, yes, that's a great example, Rick. But, as you say, only one. Heather Skullthorpe, good to talk to you this morning. Good. Thanks, Rick. Bye. My wife, I was doing a bunch of interviews that day. We sat in the green room, and Kathy was in there, and she was very friendly in a professional sort of way. And, and that's interesting because not all the journalists who've you know, come after me were friendly and professional to begin with. But she was, and and good credit to her. And then we went on air, and she she just flipped and came after me. But I'm a clinical psychologist, and I just turned into a clinical psychologist about two minutes into the interview. I thought, oh, I have learned that if you say something to someone and they don't listen, and that happens a couple of times, then you are not where you think you are and you're not talking to who you think you're talking to. Something You're somewhere else and you better clue in quick or you're going to make a fool of yourself at least. And so I just watched her and I thought, oh, I see what's going on here. And so then it, the interview wasn't a problem. And she was, she's animus possessed in, in, the, in the technical term. And, and I don't want to get into that, but, it, but it's, it's a kind of emotion driven it's possession by an emotion driven argumentative spirit and the the desire of the spirit is to attain victory it's not to have and 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 dominance essentially psychological dominance and the arguments that are utilized are tools to obtain that end there it's not a rational discussion it's not designed to further understanding of a particular topic and so that's what was happening there. And it didn't work because I saw what was happening and I didn't do that. And I, I was lucky, because fortunate, because I could maintain my sense of humor during that interview as well. And that protected me. And so, but she wasn't all that sophisticated in her ability to do that. I mean, she's, she's very extroverted and somewhat disagreeable and could poke and, and was willing to do that. So that was part of her temperament. But she wasn't armed with very sophisticated arguments and all she could really do was come up with, you know, absurd things that I might believe and tell me that that's what I believed, right? And so, and, and so they were so preposterous that it was easy to defend myself. Now, 